Welcome to Polish Jazz Podcasts from PolishJazz.com. For a complete list of our podcasts, along with a Spotify playlist for each episode, please visit PolishJazz.com slash podcasts. Today's episode is called Polish Jazz and Politics. This podcast series will be about the history of Polish jazz and its most important figures. Each episode will be released with a Spotify playlist that references all the music that we mention in the show. As a person raised in multicultural environments, I'm lucky to be in a position where I can be one foot in and one foot out, both in the American and Polish world. I cannot wait to get started, and I hope that you'll join me on this journey. Witamy, or welcome, to all you curious music lovers who have tuned into this podcast. We can't wait to get to know you. Today's show is going to be about the intersection between Polish jazz and politics. More specifically, I'd like to talk about how Polish jazz served as a proxy for a dream of capitalism, shiny Coca-Cola bottles, opportunities, and really freeing music. Anybody who wants to learn anything about Polish jazz needs to understand that it arose at a specific time. So first of all, let's give some context. I'm going to tell you a bit about life in the Soviet bloc. And although it's important to remember that Poland was never subjected to Soviet extremism, it was under Soviet rule. This inherently had repercussions into the zeitgeist and the art world, or in this case, jazz, which was inherently anti-Soviet and pro-West. So under Soviet rule, there was no freedom of information as we know it. The Soviet state, so the government, created a version of its truth. They did this by controlling the media, a control that relied on revising the truth, often in contradictory ways. Because of this, there is no official statement from the time of the Soviet Union, from a government official or even a citizen, that can be taken as anything but an ingredient in this absolutely distorted reality. Whether that material would be considered propaganda, disinformation, or anything, it is just a fundamental misrepresentation. There was a special committee of the Soviet Union that was used to restrict literary and artistic organizations. This made that there was only one artistic movement at the time, specifically socialist realism, which was the only official art movement of the Soviet Union. The point of it was to use a realistic style to depict the social reality of the working class, laborers and soldiers, in other words, the proletariat. Stalin's communism didn't have any enemies, or rather, it suspiciously didn't have any enemies, because those who were opposed to it were quickly taken away. This drastic measure was also applied to artistic people, because all art movements that had nothing to do with socialist realism were heavily controlled and often forbidden. All creative people were censored, and not conforming to the censorship was punishable by imprisonment in the terrible gulag labor camps. There are many art students that were taken prisoners in these camps. Again, although things were never as extreme as this in Poland, There was severe censorship, and for a long time, not much happened in Poland without Stalin knowing about it. There's an important Stalin quote that I think about a lot, especially in the modern United States context. He says, Ideas are more dangerous than guns. We would not let our enemies have guns. Why should we let them have ideas? This quote sticks with me because there are few forces in the world that are as powerful as art. And God, Polish jazz had a lot of ideas. This is where Willis Conover came in. Tuning radios illegally to the voice of America became a form of escapism for censorship for young people like Krzysztof Kometa. Anybody who has listened to Conover's voice can understand how one could begin to idealize the West, American freedom, and jazz after listening to him. With the voice of America, Jazz Hour. On the night of... There's something unique to him. An American celebration of art, freedom, and thought. In the renowned media theory text, The Medium is the Massage, Robert McLuhan talks about how media has a pervasive quality of becoming part of our environment, massaging itself into the very essence of our society and our minds. 
I think of Conover's voice like this, massaging itself into young Polish people's minds for years to come. Even people who never knew of Conover felt that sense of American idealism. Thanks to him, jazz was a way to dream of a better world. He created the proxy between the West and freedom. In Washington, D.C., 1956. My grandfather on my mother's side worked for the communist state. Thanks to communism, he was able to move from the countryside and achieve success in the big city of Warsaw. He was, consequently, very pro-Soviet, and above all else, pro-communism. My mother, on the other hand, born into the grim reality of the Soviet bloc country, could not help but dream bigger. When her dad was sent on foreign missions to Western countries, he would bring back exotic and unheard gifts like Coca-Cola, denim jeans, and chocolate. These foreign gifts made her mind soar to places outside of communist Poland. There's a particular story that she tells a lot when my dad's sister, so my aunt, had gotten her hands on a kiwi fruit. They cut it into enough pieces for the whole family to try, and everybody took a tiny piece into their mouths, letting the tangy fruit melt in their mouth long enough to taste it longer. That hunger for difference and for foreign influence was mirrored in the voracious listening habits of jazz fans. The irony is that I'm allergic to kiwi. But what a great music genre to get this kind of treatment. Jazz is all about improvisation. George Gershwin, one of my favorite composers, said that life is a lot like jazz. It's a lot better when you improvise. I like to think that the reason he said that was because improvisation creates an atmosphere of freedom of expression, the possibility to try things that you wouldn't have thought of, and most importantly, the room to dream. But it was very difficult for Polish people to dream or try new things because, first of all, they could not join any political party except for the Communist Party. They could not watch movies, read books, or listen to music that they wanted to listen to. Except, of course, heavily censored content that was allowed by the communist regime, which was considered lame. They could not dress freely. They couldn't cut their hair the way they wanted to. The ruling system was on the lookout for anybody who was non-conforming to the Puritan rules of Soviet fashion. They had no places to gather or share their own opinions, and there were no independent organizations to join. And of course, there were severe limitations when it came to religious freedom. But there was jazz, which became a proxy for political and personal freedom. Interestingly, the underground culture of jazz in Soviet time Poland and the hunger for freedom manifested itself not only in music, but also in fashion. I'm talking, of course, about the subculture of bikiniaja. The word bikiniaj is the loosely Polish equivalent of the American word beatnik, a person who rejects conventional society and instead embraces artistic self-expression. Bikiniaja came from jazz culture enthusiasts, and the journalist and writer Leopold Tegmand, who became the most important animator of the jazz scene in the 1950s. He was their leader. Leopold Tegmand is the best example of the intersection between Polish jazz politics and the quest for freedom in communist Poland. He was known for his uncompromising attitude, unconventional lifestyle, and colorful socks and ties. His elegant suits were bought used in second-hand stores, which was the only place to find Western clothing in communist Poland. But he had an amazing tailor, who made them look bright new and dandy. Tegemann looked, walked, and talked like nobody else in Poland those days, and soon became the leader of the emerging jazz movement. He organized first music festivals and concerts, and he also wrote the first jazz monograph in Poland titled Ubrzegów Jazu, or In the Shores of Jazz. Tegemond later emigrated to the U.S., where he collaborated with The New Yorker and lectured at Columbia University. Until his death in 1985, he remained a fierce anti-communist and kept in touch with conservative American elites. We recommend for you to visit our website, polishjazz.com, to watch a short documentary movie about Tegemond called Freedom Fighter in Bright Socks. Here is Tegemond himself. Byli zupełnie odcięci od tego, co jazz. Wszystko, co mówiłem... Reagowali na to w sposób tak niesłychanie. 
Tirmand and the Biquinaje were part of a worldwide youth movement based on the street subculture of Mexican Americans and Black American Harlem, the so-called Zoot Suits. They call themselves Teddy Boys in Great Britain, Zazu in France, Malangabists in Romania, Potapka in Czechoslovakia, and believe it or not, there were even Biquinaje in the USSR, where they were known as Stiliagi. The authorities of Poland and other Soviet bloc countries actively combated this youth movement, considering it a manifestation of cosmopolitan tendencies and forbidden love for the U.S. The main difference from the beatniks was their attitude towards consumerism. Bikinyaje loved everything with the label made in the USA, and jazz music was always in the front row, along with Western clothes, Coca-Cola, affection for American brand beer cans, cigarettes, and any Western-made gadgets they could get their hands on. Young jazz aficionados in Poland were unaware of many racial tensions and the complexity of the development of jazz in the United States. But they didn't know, because jazz for them was freedom, and the U.S. for them was the best. Jazz fans in Soviet Poland were unaware that the development of jazz in the United States was imbued with social and racial tension and complexities that Poland never had. These are many of the same racial fights that are still taking place in, in the United States today. In fact, as we are exiting 2020, we are leaving behind the largest American protest movement that we have ever seen. The Black Lives Matter protests fought for racial justice, which America still does not have. Polish jazz, although from a completely different and separate context, personally gives me a fire to dream of some kind of a better world. In the same way that Polish people idealize Conover and classic jazz musicians such as Miles Davis, I idealize and reach towards something bigger. My own dream that redefines the way that we view race, gender, sexuality, culture, and all aspects that are out of a person's control. So that is why I tune into jazz, just like my parents. I just dream different dreams. This podcast was recorded by the Polish Jazz Network, a coalition of musicians, professionals, and jazz enthusiasts. Voice recording and sound editing was done by Misha Lerska. The text was written by Cesare Lursky and Misha Lurska. Music is sampled from the musicians mentioned above. Piano music in the introduction and conclusion was played by jazz musician Mia Tuchillo. All rights to this podcast are reserved by the Polish Jazz Network. <laughs>